Um, welcome all the panelists. Um, thank you all for coming and everyone for, for coming to the panel. Welcome to our panel on helping people on the planet. Um, in, in just a minute, Jerry will get things started and introduce everyone. Uh, but I wanted to take a minute just up front to kick it off and share what I think is so special about our panel discussions. Um, you know, as you know, we've been discussing there are infinite paths you can take in a given career panel or career track. And there are really so many ways that STEM professionals help people and the planet. Today, we want to not only give you a glimpse and inspire you with some of the paths that others have taken in different fields and, and the way that they're making a difference in the world, um, but we also want to give you all an opportunity to see that in addition to all of our panelists being incredibly accomplished, there are also people just like you that started out just like you. They've had question like, questions like yours, have taken many turns in their careers, and even had lots of challenges on the way. Um, so you'll not only get a chance to hear about their work and what they do, but also get you know a little bit of a glimpse behind the scenes of a successful career in STEM. Um, so and network next week we're going to be talking more about networking, um, a lot more about networking. We haven't yet, um, but these panel discussions are really a unique and a great opportunity to network. All of our esteemed panelists have taken the time to come be with us today and share their insights with you. And they really wanna help you explore your career options. So one way you can support them and thank them for, for coming here today to be with you is to turn on your cameras, You know, let them know you're here. Um, if you can't turn your camera on, let them know in the chat when something resonates with you. I know they will all love to meet you and see you all, um, just as I know you are looking forward to hearing from all of them. So with that, uh, a very, again, a very warm welcome to all of our panelists, and thank you so much for joining us today. And I'll turn it over to Jerry to introduce everyone now. Thank you, Elisa. I'm really excited. Um, and again, I want um, the Repicture team wants to emphasize for these panels um, that not just engineers are in these professions, um, but there are a plethora of different STEM professionals that work to help others. Um, and specifically today, you'll see how um, they are helping people in the planet. Um, so with that, I will introduce our panelists. Um, let's see, cool. So this is a little poster of everyone. But yes, before we get started, actually, um, because we're hearing from um, STEM effort experts today, um, I want people to utilize the chat function and um, answer this question of what do you all think is the most important part of helping people um, and or the planet? Anyone, anyone? everything. Okay, making it safe for the future generation, cooperation, creating sustainable solutions. Oh, that's cool. I took a class called sustainable solutions. Planning. Cool. So thank you for everyone. And I think all of those. Oh, and being mindful. Oh, okay, we're going to keep going. Being mindful of every action we take working with others because one person can't do it on their own. And I'm going to read this last one of making sure the solutions are accessible for all, all people. Um, so thank you to everyone who has um, commented. I think those are really, uh, really good. And um, we'll be hearing from um, some people today um, who are going to um, share a lot. So um, our first panelist is um, Amy Breeden. Um, she graduated with a BS in civil engineering. Um, then moved on to attain um, a Master's of Information and Data Science, or um, MIDS. Um, and she's currently a data scientist in public health that works to improve access to mental health care through reporting on mental health provider network quality and availability. Um, next, we have um, uh, Brian McGee. Um, he graduated with a Bachelor's of Science in uh, or a BS in elementary education um, and then attained a Master's in Instructional Technology with a specialist degree in school administration um, and is an environmental educator that developed the nonprofit Simulations Foundation that is fundraising for the Southern Green Alliance and Students Taking Action. 
Um, our third panelist, who I don't believe has made it yet, is um, uh, Dr. Mosey London, who um, graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Environmental Engineering. Um, for anyone who went to Lafayette, who went to Lafayette too. Um, uh, also um, attained a master's and a PhD in civil engineering with focus in transportation engineering and currently works as a transportation planning project manager in Washington, DC. And last we have um, Jody, um, our director of student success, um, who uh, has a bachelor's in, bachelor in biology and environmental science um, and spent or had a 40 year career in the public water and sewer industry for two of the largest water and wastewater utilities in the world. So with that, and to learn more about our panelists, because they are far more than what I just gave you right here. Uh, remember, you can um, access their pages on repicture.com slash people. And um, you can also continue to check this throughout our program um, as, um, as they may make changes um, as, as time goes on. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and we'll get started. So um, our first question today is going to be asked by um, Brian Cruz. Um, and Brian goes to Allen Hancock College and is a, a second year mechanical engineering student. And I'll also be um, posting the questions in the chat as well, but um, Brian, take it away. Hello everyone. So uh, my question was, what is the most unique project you have been a part of? And maybe something you were not expecting to work on. And this is a question for all panelists to answer. Um, would anyone like to go first or I can, I can volunteer someone to go? Okay, <laughs> I'm happy to go first. Uh, well, I, I've worked on so many things, but the thing that I worked on that was, I would really call life-changing because it was so brutally demanding was that, uh, that in 2003, I went to work for DC Water. DC Water provides all the water and sewer service for the nation's capital. And I was very innocently sitting in new employee orientation um, that I was called out of. Um, in 2003, DC was in the middle of a lead and water crisis. So a, a lot of you, I assume, have heard about Flint, Michigan and the lead and water crisis. So before there was Flint, Michigan, the poster child for lead and water crises in the country was Washington, DC. What this meant is that the levels of lead in customer taps, you know, coming out of their sink was higher than was allowable by EPA. And so I got called out of new employee orientation and my boss said to me, Jody, there's a water crisis in DC and I need somebody to manage it. It's either gonna be you or it's gonna be me and I vote you. And uh, my life really changed at that point. This was something that was on the front page of the Washington Post every day for well over a year. You know, I'd have to get up in front of audiences of, um, once there was a room of 500 parents that were just enraged about how lead and water could be affecting their children. And um, it was something I was never prepared for. Um, and uh, I, I don't think you can ever be prepared for something like that, but I would certainly say that, that that's, it was certainly unique. Thank you, Jody. Um, I see that Mosi is here. Would you like to answer that question? Yes, uh, thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm happy to be on the call. Um, I, I really uh, resonate with your story, Jody. I think for me, it's a similar situation where I think the, um, the, the, the sense of uh, emergency or the importance of the project tends to uh, make it more high profile. So um, in my previous position, I worked for New York City Emergency Management um, as a part of their interim flood protection uh, program. Um, this program was uh, funded by the, the mayor's office, 
and it was really in response to Hurricane Sandy, which you know in 2012 really uh, decimated the um, um, Lower Manhattan area, some Queens and the Rockaways. Um, so they were really looking at you know how can we increase the resiliency of, of, of you know the most important facilities and infrastructure. Um, so that was definitely very high profile. And um, if any of you have worked with uh, the other uh, professionals on the call with um, uh, the mayor's office, uh, political office, you can know that um, everything is you know uh, a land issue or or a uh, meat issue. Brian, would you like to um, sure. answer as well? Yeah, um, I guess educationally, one of the best things I've worked on was simulations for students. Uh, they simulate what it is they'll do in real life. But the thing I guess I'll talk about here is uh, my job as a, um, a union president. One of the things that happened was we discovered down in one place that I worked that they were inappropriately testing or preparing students for standardized testing. And um, I attempted to resolve the problem in the normal manner without success. And so we finally had to go to the press and uh, we ended up uh, breaking uh, the story and what is the stars and stripes I work for the federal government. And that brought the world crashing down in many, many ways. Um, and the reason I bring it up here is because sometimes you're gonna find that even though things may not work out the best for you because of actions that you take, that you need to do what is right at a specific time in your life. And you're gonna be challenged. Every single one of us is, and you will be too, challenged to do what is right over what is expedient or what it might be uh, in your best interest in your career. Um, but doing right is important. Um, in this particular case, what ended up happening was it actually went up to Congress and we were able to get um, uh, special regulations written that prevented or stopped um, inappropriate testing or test preparation for standardized tests. And that uh, action stood for, oh, almost 20 years before some other enlightened educator at the very top decided he was going to uh, take out the regulation. But at any rate, you gotta do what's right at the right time. All right, I think I'm the last one. Uh, so I recently moved into the mental health care space, but before that I was working at an electronic medical record software company. Um, and in January of last year, I just switched roles to become a data scientist working on creating this really large repository of de-identified medical records uh, to be used for research. Uh, but a few months into that, uh, near the end of March, I got pulled into a meeting and was told to drop everything and see what insights we could provide about COVID-19 using this new database that we were standing up. Um, so the first questions that we were asked seem kind of silly now. Uh, they were things like, are there certain blood types that might be protective against COVID? Uh, but back then the world knew next to nothing about COVID. So we were really investigating a ton of different ideas coming from all over the place. Um, so I pulled together a team of people that had backgrounds in public health and data science in biostatistics. And we were all digging into all of these questions that were coming in. Uh, well, my company was putting together a website so that we'd be able to share our findings with the rest of the world. Um, so one of the early findings that we shared, I still remember, um, it was a study on how ventilator survival rates varied by age group and by gender. Um, and the, those rates ranged from over 70% survival rates for the younger age groups to less than 20% for older age groups. Um, and at that time, everyone was really worried about ventilator shortages, uh, who should get the few ventilators that were available, who was going to do well on a ventilator. Um, we heard from several clinicians that the study that we put out there was really valuable information that they weren't able to find elsewhere um, at the time. And so during, during this period, I worked a lot of 90 plus hour weeks, especially early on, and that was really hard. Um, but at the same time, you know, this was early in the pandemic and it was also very motivating for me to have a job where I felt like I could actually make some kind of a difference um, when everything just felt so crazy and uh, there were a lot of unknowns. 
Um, so that for me will probably always be one of the most memorable projects that I've worked on. That's awesome. Thank you all um, for sharing. So I'm going to um, move on to our um, next question. And this is more of a like quick lightning round question. Um, so uh, for each of your careers, well, each of your careers address helping people or the planet in some way. So what are the greatest challenges facing people and or the planet that you address in your work? And please give either a phrase or one sentence, very short answers. I can go, climate change, climate change, climate change. Mine would be inadequate and unfairly distributed access to mental health care. And mine will be that uh, people actually want to do right. They would like to help. They don't know how, and you can't go at it in a combative, but instead in a supportive manner. Um, mine would be responding to uh, disasters that occur immediately and then the long and hard process of recovery. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. And also your audio is a lot better. So thank you. Um, so uh, our next question um, is for Mosi and um, it'll be asked by Tabitha, uh, one of our peer mentors. Um, Tabitha is a rising junior. Um, at Lehigh University majoring in environmental science. Um, and her current career interests are both environmental science and writing. So Tabitha, you can go ahead. All right, thank you, Gary. And thank you to all the panelists for coming. I'm so glad you're all here. Um, so Mosi, um, do you address climate change in your work? And if so, how? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. I think in terms of how I personally address climate change. Um, it's more of the, the effects of it. I, I wish I was in work that I'm, you know, um, was, um, you know working against the causes, but I, I think more, more so just the effects. So um, as you know, it's summer, um, it's very hot outside. We're seeing, you know, uh, heat records that we haven't seen before. I know in the um, Northwest, they've been breaking several records. In Canada, there's been a lot of records broken in, in terms of that. And that's really directly one of the effects of climate change. So in terms of response to that, it really is direct in terms of how we design uh, pedestrian facilities. So um, there's a lot of these places that are you know, um, walkable. There may not be adequate shading or um, tree infrastructure there to provide um, coverage. Um, uh, in terms of the direct impact, um, walking in the direct sunlight versus walking in the shade, it can be you know several degrees uh, cooler. Um, in a lot of these areas where there may be walking facilities, there um, there aren't enough adequate um, shades. So that not only puts people at risk, but it discourages people from, from walking. So in terms of the pedestrian design that that we do, we try to provide ad adequate um, pedestrian facilities. So that includes. Uh, coverage of fire trees, um, having seating, you know, uh, available for those who, who may want to take a break, um, walking, um, you know, short or long distances. It's really about providing as as much um, adequate infrastructure to support that. Um, so that's really the, the effects. In terms of some of the work that I do in ter um, of, of the causes, it's really about decongestion management. Um, I think when it comes to the impacts of, uh, of pollution, directly to climate change, you know, the transportation industry is one of the, the biggest, core, um, you know, um, industry that's responsible for it. Uh, the aviation industry makes up for a large percentage, not only just the automobile industry. So in terms of work that I do, I try to focus on emerging mobility technologies, encouraging people outside of their vehicle. If they are in their vehicle, try to do van pooling, car pooling, anything that can deter people from doing uh, SOV or single op vehicles. I think it's probably one of the biggest threats to climate change, but it's also one of the ones that can be easily mitigated. Um, I think when it comes to other impacts of climate change, it's really hard to, to you know, capture and leave those to the experts, but it really does come down to, to personal use and, and behaviors. However, the government and industries need to, you know, encourage those type of behaviors. So how do you get people out of their vehicles? You need to provide adequate public transportation. How do you reduce the, the emissions? You need to have fuel efficient vehicles, ones that aren't dependent on fossil fuels. So all, all of these come into effect when it, when it really um, relates to, to the impacts of climate change.
Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, that, was, that was a that was a really great answer. Um, uh, so we'll move on to our next question. And this one is for um, Amy. Um, and our next question is going to be asked by Nahir. Um, Nahir is a senior at Mills High School in the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, Nahir is interested in pediatric general surgery as a future career. Um, and the reason uh, for this is because um, she'll always be glad to see the happiness of people after helping them. So um, Nahir, um, would you like to ask your question? Yes, sure. Hello. Uh, my question is, how, how have you be addressed public health in your work? Yeah, so I think I already talked about my experience with doing research on COVID-19 in the pandemic, so that's definitely one way. Um, another really interesting project that I was working on uh, before COVID-19, you know, interrupted our lives, uh, was a project to proactively identify adverse drug reactions using medical records. Um, so there's a really great example from about 20 years ago when there was a drug called Vioxx, which is kind of like a stronger version of Advil. Um, and it was recalled because it was discovered five years after it was put on the market uh, that patients were having a higher risk of heart attacks or strokes uh, when they were taking this drug. So clinical trials are really great at discovering short-term side effects, things like skin rashes, headaches, vomiting, um, but there's often longer term side effects that aren't yet known when the drug is submitted to the FDA for approval. Um, and that's things like the heart attack, strokes, cancer, um, that just take time uh, to surface. Another common problem that uh, we run into is that clinical trials are often based, are biased in terms of who they recruit. Um, so they often exclude patients that are taking other medications, for example. So we might find out after the drug is out in the wild that certain combinations of drugs are resulting in adverse reactions that we just hadn't seen before. Um, so the project that I worked on was creating an automated program to look at the medical records of all the people in that huge database that I was talking about um, who were taking a certain drug. Um, so that would often be hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of patients and then see if there were any adverse events that were more common in those patients than in patients who looked like them but weren't actually taking the drug. Um, the goal being that if there's another situation like Vioxx that comes along again, we want to be able to identify that, you know, hey, patients taking this drug seem to have higher rates of cancers than we'd expect to see. We should really look into this further and assess the impacts of these drugs um, in this different population or on this longer time scale than what was previously done in clinical trials. Awesome. That's really awesome. Um, thank you, Amy. And also, um, I forgot to say this, but thank you also, Brian and um, Tabitha, and thank you Nahir for asking your questions so far. Um, so we're gonna move on to our next question, and this is for all of our panelists. Um, and the next question is going to be asked by Catherine Wynn. Um, and uh, she's a high school student at um, Notre Dame High School. So Catherine, yeah, you can take Hi, it away. So, what would be your top career advice for someone that wants a career in helping people or the planet? And I guess we can go in the same order we've been going in. Um, so Jody, would you like to take that one? Yeah, I don't know that it's helping people and the planet or it, whether this relates to every career. Um, and I hope everybody will remember this. I'm going to say, use your head. I mean, you got one, kind of controls everything. Uh, you need to think. You need to just be thinking all the time. You need to be creative. You need to be analytical and you need to trust yourself. So I think using your head, I put top on the list. Um, I know that in the repicture program, there's been a lot of emphasis on this. I know that Tabitha sent out some uh, opportunities right well. I think that if two people have an equal amount of technical talent and one can write well and the other is not a strong writer, the one who can write well is going to 
outperform, be rated higher, be promoted more often. And so I, I, I think that's extremely important. And then I think take on as many different kinds of projects as you can. I think one reason that I got so far in my career, um, you know, for a woman, I was in engineering and that wasn't easy to do when you graduate in 1979. Um, those, it's not easy to prove yourself, but I always took on every project that was offered to me and I always did it and I, I used my head, I wrote about it. And anyway, those are the things that I think you can do that will get you the furthest in any career that you choose. All right, I'll, I'll go next. The, um, I would agree with everything Jody said. Yay, Jody. The, um, the, uh, the thing I'll add, and it's not that she left it out, is I'd be positive. Oh, there's nothing worse in the workplace than a negative person. I mean, be positive. It doesn't mean you have to be Pollyanna about it, you know, and oh, everything's going to be fine. No, you, but you have to be positive and work positively. Also, work hard. You don't have to be a, a workaholic, but People notice if somebody's trying to take shortcuts, get out of something, whatever. Just be there all the time. Do your best. Work hard. People will notice, and that will help you get ahead. Uh, Amy, you can go ahead. Um, so for me, I studied civil engineering in undergrad, but then my first job out of college was doing something entirely different uh, as a technical services engineer, uh, helping hospitals implement electronic medical record software. And over the course of my career, I've had three pretty different roles. Um, but the one constant is that I've always worked for companies in the healthcare industry that I felt like were truly trying to improve access to and quality of healthcare. Um, so if you're the type of person who knows exactly what you're passionate about and you can go out there, find 100 jobs to apply for where you'd be doing exactly that thing, more power to you, but that was not me. Um, I've really always struggled to pinpoint exactly which roles interest me. Um, so I've had the most success spending time trying to find companies whose mission I truly believe in and then finding what role or roles sound interesting at that company. Um, and I've also found that even if that first role that you get into isn't quite the right fit, if you really enjoy that company that you're working for, if you believe in their mission, it's usually pretty easy to move into a new role at that existing company rather than, you know, having to start over again on your job search each time. Um, so my advice would be start with companies rather than jobs. Thank you. And then, Hi. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I agree with everything that the, the panelists say. Um, in terms of, you know, the idea of what the topic is about for um, um, this panel discussion, I think the biggest thing is do no harm. Um, that's the, you know, the, the oath that medical doctors take. And I think that whatever industry you're in, I think that's the biggest thing. I, I think the work that we do, you always have to look at it through a lens of am I hurting or uh, negatively impacting a specific group or populace or uh, the environment by what I'm doing? Um, so I think that's probably something that any um, industry professional can, can take. Um, next, I would say that in terms of um, being successful in your career, the biggest thing is networking. If there's someone who's um, willing to, to lend you their you know, advice, um, you know, their experience, listen. Um, I think that's what um, has allowed me to, to, to uh, be in the business center at MPA. I don't necessarily have all the experiences of, of the people that I listen to, but I was able to gain the knowledge from it. So I think that when people are offering you their, their opinions, um, whether you know you take them or not, I think you can always get something out of it. Um, in my experience, I've been able to uh, you know uh, get a bright set, set of experience and work with different types of professionals. So I got my PhD and I was able to teach on a, a collegiate level. So that was one experience in academia. Um, and then I worked for uh, New York City government for several years, so I was able to work in the public sector. Um, and now I'm with the private consulting firm, so getting um, you know a, a real sense of you know how does the private industry work. And I think within all those job um, industry types, there may be a subject area that you can do. So I can work. I've been working on transportation throughout all of my career, but they were in different industries. So um, with that, you can get a different lens of what you're what you're going to be doing in that industry. So I think um, for for public health. 
uh, I'm sure the public health professional on the call can, can correct me if I'm wrong, working in the public sector and public health versus the private sector versus academia, they are related, but they they all have different, you know, um, scopes of work, I would say. Um, so I think just thinking about not only the industry you want to be in, but the, the sector, whether it's public, uh, private, or academia, um, nonprofit, just thinking about what type of um, um, branch you would like to explore. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, all of your answers are actually very insightful. Um, so we're going to um, move on to a question for Jody. Um, and it will be asked by another peer mentor, Catherine, um, who graduated from Catholic University um, in 2020 and with civil engineering degree and just completed her first year of her master's program at Manhattan College in environmental engineering. So Catherine. Hi, Jody. My question is, what choices did you make that defined your career that you didn't know would at the time? Well, that's an interesting question because um, uh, for me, uh, the choice part is a little bit questionable. I think one of the best things that ever happened to me in my career was being laid off from work. Um, I started, I mean, this sounds like a funny answer, but uh, I started off my career. I, I graduated from college. I always knew I was interested in water. I knew that, that you know, the, the, the key to protecting people is making sure that they have clean, adequate water supply and adequate wastewater treatments. So I, I was passionate about that, I, but I had no idea what I was going to do. Um, I think it was by happenstance that I got a job working for a small um, environmental consulting firm right around the Beltway in Washington, D.C., just circles Washington, D.C. And within a year, a, a little over a year of getting that job, and there was a big political change. Jimmy Carter had been president when I got out of college. And then, you know, a year into my career, Ronald Reagan became president. And when Ronald Reagan became president, all of the funding for important environmental initiatives that consulting firms had sort of been feeding off of, those funds were, were just eliminated. And so small consulting firms that were all around the country just died almost overnight. And so when I, with the company that I worked for, went out of business, as, as most environmental consulting firms did, and at that point, there were no jobs in the private sector. And so I was forced to look in the public sector. And that's when I went to work for Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission. It's about the seventh largest water and wastewater utility in the world. But what I discovered through that was that the private sector was really no place for me. I mean, my heart was in doing work that had nothing to do with making a product, a, a profit. You know, my heart was in working for a, a public water utility. Um, and I wound up uh, working for Washington Suburban Sanitary Commission for 22 years. And following that, another 12 years for DC Water, which is another very large. In fact, I worked at Blue Plant Water Treatment Plant in DC, which is the single largest wastewater treatment plant in the world. You know, so kind of anyway, the 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 best choice I ever made was sort of a non-choice. Getting laid off from work was the best thing that ever happened in my career. Awesome. Thank you, Jody. Um, and we're going to move on to um, the next question. Um, and this one is for uh, Brian, because um, when we went through the lightning round of um, some of the greatest challenges, I think um, you talked about um, education inequity and like how people are not necessarily or don't necessarily know a lot about um, like certain aspects of um, climate uh, and so on. So um, could you further answer um, some of the greatest challenges you have faced in your career in that, in that, in that aspect? 
Um, yes. Oh. Is it my turn? Okay. Um, one of the things that um, I had talked about as a, as a, was the um, challenge of keeping education for education rather than for making money or whatever. But another thing was I became uh, convinced very early on that uh, students get a lot more out of education if in fact they can see the relevance. And I've learned many different techniques of making them see the relevance through simulating reality, simulating real life. And um, as a result, um, we started um, a company way back in the 1990s, you know, when the internet was just getting going. And I registered the domain name simulations.com. And we started a group of us uh, educators to try and work with um, simulations as a way to further education. Well, what we found out at the time was that uh, if any school had the internet, they had a single computer on a dial-up modem in their library, okay? And this makes no sense to a lot of you right now, but that's the way it was back then. It was like the time when mice had tails, you know? Um, but at any rate, the, what we had to do is we had to put all that stuff on the back burner, not give it up, but put it on the back burner. And so many times ideas that you might have that are great, you know they will work, but it's not a, the right time for them yet. Um, for example, climate change. What's happening out West with the, the, the forest fires and what's happening with the water shortages in the, in the Southwest and what have you, these are terrible things. And many of you know and knew that this was going to happen, but the public was not there yet. And so don't give up on stuff. You, the, if, you, if you're right, if you're right and you know you're right, keep at it, be positive, do the right thing today. And eventually it's gonna to come to fruition as bad as it may be as terrible as it may be, um, if you're right, things will eventually catch up. So stay positive, stay, work hard at it. Don't give up. Don't get into confrontations all the time. I mean, I've been there. I've done it that way too. Uh, but they typically don't change people's minds and hearts. So I guess that's about it. <laughs> Thank you for that answer. Um, that's really great. Um, so we're going to move on to our last section of the panel today, and that is um, some lightning questions. Um, and again, one word or a phrase, um, sentence as mo at most. Um, so the first lightning question um, is, what skill have you all used the most? Um, and let's start with Mosi this time. Yeah, I would go back to the, the other comments the panelists made is writing. Writing is probably the most important skill that, that you'll use. It's the primary form of education, whether it's informal, um, via you know, email, text, or your writing report that will be seen by thousands of people and uh, will be made public and a part of deposition and court documents. Um, so uh, write, write, write. Um, regardless of what the type of writing is, being able to complete such Did. I'm not sure if that cut out. It did. Yeah. Oh, I just, I just for me. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Um, uh, and then Amy, would you like to go? Sure. So for technical skills, I would say SQL and Python I use every day. Uh, but in terms of more soft skills, I think communication with both technical and non-technical audiences. And Brian? Um, Yes, I, I believe that creativity, think outside the box. Don't always, if your boss is thinking X, it doesn't mean that it's the right answer, okay? Think outside the box, be positive about it and, and you know, be creative. Thank you, and uh, last Jody. 
Yeah, I think those are all important things. I'm going to add to it leadership. You, you just got to put yourself out there and show leadership skills, not necessarily day one of your career, but it's something that you build over time. And, and I think that's really important. Awesome. Thank you for those answers. So um, we are at 144. So I want to open it up for um, additional student questions that you may have that, um, and you can utilize the chat. Um, and also, um, if you don't want to ask your question out loud, you can send it to me and I can ask it for you. Um, but yes, I'm going to open up the chat for um, any additional questions you may have. And also to our panelists, um, I know for uh, 145 is the cutoff time, but would you be okay with staying until 150? Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, I see a question for me about what courses did I study in college that led to becoming a data scientist? Um, so in my undergrad, I took a lot of math classes because I was interested in it um, and it was, you know, required for civil engineering. Um, I also took a single programming class, but found that I actually really enjoyed that. Um, and I think that was kind of still in the back of my mind when a few years into my career, I decided to get a master's. Um, and so in my master's degree, I would say the, the most important courses were honestly my like intro to Python coding class, because um, I think that gave me a lot of the fundamentals that I needed to be a bit more confident in teaching myself the more advanced uh, programming skills I needed. Um, and then my statistics classes, again, for the same reason of just giving me that really strong foundation to then be able to go out and learn more on my own. Thank you. Um, I got a question uh, for Brian also. Um, with some people being interested in um, working uh, for nonprofits, um, what are some unique aspects of working for one? Um, if you're going to work for a nonprofit, um, you can't expect to get rich. Okay, it's typically not where it's happening. And what I'd recommend you do is join with me real quick because we're just starting up, okay? So you get in at the ground level if you can, all right? But the reality is, um, as I'm in a nonprofit, you have to go into it with your heart and your soul. You have to really believe in what it is that you're doing um, if you wanna be successful. Awesome, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, any other um, questions from students? I have a question for the students. I sure. want to know why this topic is important to everybody. You're going to be the brains of the future, you know, you're going to be taking it all over. So why is helping people and the planet important to you? Um, so I think that helping people and the planet is really important since in order to help ourselves, we have to ensure our environment is doing well. So I think by creating solutions that can be sustainable and address both the interests of us as well as interests of the environment, I think that we can then better improve our hum uh, humanity as well as better improve our environment. So, yeah. I also wanted to add that uh, I think we just have to be selfless for, I mean, future generations, try to keep it going as much as we can. Thank you, Miriam and Brian for that. Um, I will say that um, something pretty interesting um, that maybe people would be interested in is looking into how um, a lot of careers have changed during COVID-19. Um, and I'm specifically talking, um, well, to be more specific, I would like people to check out some research that I was able to do with Dr. London, um, who's here with us today. 
um, on how COVID-19 has impacted uh, essential workers um, through transportation and public policy. Um, and um, that's very embarrassing to like plug into this, um, <laughs> this panel, but um, since uh, um, Mosi is here, um, I thought it would, um, that would be something that if you all wanted to read about it, you could on the Repicture site because it's now there. Um, and um, with that, because it is just about 1.50, um, I want to, again, thank the panelists, all of you for um, being here and for participating in this. Um, I think uh, we got a lot of um, really important and very insightful information um, that we wouldn't typically get. And um, I also want to thank everyone who um, attended today um, and also actively um, uh, either participated in the chat as well as um, asked questions. Um, and with that, uh, we'll end the panel or end the recording. <laughs>